Welcome guys, we'll be talking about toxic shock syndrome. This is something that's asked very commonly in a lot of examinations and is one of the important topics, especially if you're working in the emergency department. So let's see what a toxic shock syndrome is and what the definition means. So this is a clinical syndrome which is caused by a toxin from Staphylococcus aureus. So that's the first thing we need to know. It is caused by Staphylococcus aureus and it's caused by a toxin released by Staphylococcus aureus. Now, the important thing is that there are criteria which must be present to say that this patient has a toxic shock syndrome. So the first one is fever. So fever more than 38.9 or 102 degree Fahrenheit. Um, rash which is a characteristic macular erythroderma and hypotension and desquamation so these four all four of these must be present which are the major criteria in classifying someone having a toxic shock syndrome now the next one is a multi-system involvement so at least three of the systems should be involved okay so gastrointestinal muscular mucous membrane hyperemia, renal, hepatic, hematological, and uh, CNS, neurological changes. So these are the changes that should be present, and at least three of them should be present to classify someone as a toxic shock syndrome. Number three, we should exclude sepsis. Now, this is usually done by blood cultures, lumbar punctures, and uh, some antibodies in the blood. So toxic shock syndrome was first described in 1978 and the case definition was developed by the Center for Disease Control in 1980. Initiating factors are all basically anything that can cause a staph aureus infection and that can lead to a toxin release by staph aureus and causing the toxic shock syndrome. The important thing, however, is to be aware of the differential diagnosis and the main differential in toxin shock syndrome toxic shock syndrome is bacterial sepsis okay so toxic shock syndrome remember is not a sepsis per se but is uh, something that happens this is a manifestation of a particular type of bacteria toxin okay so staphylococcus toxin so that is a toxic shock syndrome um, now erythema multiforme is another differentiation that you should do Rocky Mountain spotty fever, toxic epidermal necro uh, necrolysis, leptospirosis, and Kawasaki syndrome. So these are some of the differential diagnoses. But as I said, sepsis is the most important diagnosis, and you should rule out sepsis to say that this patient has toxic shock syndrome. And the next one is scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, hemolytic uremic syndrome, rubeola, and gastroenteritis. So these are the other differential diagnoses, but the most important, as we've said again and again, is sepsis. Now the complications that can happen include persistent hypotension with organ damage, respiratory failure, renal failure, and bleeding from thrombocytopenia. Okay, so what should you be doing for a patient who do you suspect to have a toxic shock syndrome? So first things first are oxygen and monitoring, airway management, large bow IV cannulas. Then you remove the inciting factors. Tampons are considered to be one of the important causes of toxic shock syndrome. Um, so remove the tampon and irrigate the vagina with betadine, drain the abscess or empyema if it's present, remove any nasal or wound packing and irrigate. Next, you should do investigation not only to diagnose toxic shock syndrome, but also to rule out other causes if there are any doubts. You should always do relevant cultures, chest x-ray, Foley's catheter, and the patient should be admitted to the intensive care unit. The secondary aspects of treatment include antibiotics for Staphylococcus aureus. However, as we said, it is not sepsis, and it's a manifestation of Staphylococcus toxin, uh, so the antibiotics are actually proven not to be very helpful. Presses, vasopressors, if the patient is not responding to normal resuscitation measures like normal saline and other fluids, and if the bicarb, IV bicarb should be given if it's severe acidosis. If the patient has low calcium, you give calcium, and if it develops renal failure, the patient needs a dialysis.
intubation is required from quite a lot of these patients and IV steroids may be given but that's controversial. Now while during the hospital we should monitor the response and do further investigations to make sure there are no other differential diagnosis, monitor the fluid status, do a repeated chest x-ray, uh, daily irrigations, reculturing and switch from intravenous to parole antibiotics when the patient improves. Now this may reoccur in 10% of the patients, that's something we should be aware about. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked our video. Keep coming back for more.